to welcome you all here um, for this event to celebrate the recent release of After Camus, a novel by Jay Nugaborn. Uh, first round of applause cue would be here. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and introduce tonight's panel. Jay Nugaborn is the author of 22 books, including five prize-winning novels, four collections of award-winning stories, and two prize-winning books of nonfiction. His stories and essays have appeared widely in the New York Review of Books, the Atlantic Monthly, the American Scholar, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Plowshares, Tablet, and Commonweal, among others, and have been reprinted in more than 50 anthologies, including the Best American Short Stories and the O. Henry Prize Stories. He's a recipient of the fellowship from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment of the Arts, the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Council on the Arts, and is the only author to have won six consecutive syndicated fiction prizes. Uh, his archive is housed at the Harry Ransom Humanities Center in Austin, Texas. Joining him in conversation tonight is Jerome Charn, who's the author of more than 50 works of fiction and nonfiction, including Ravage, the, Ravage and Son, uh, Sergeant Salinger, uh, Caesar, a novel of war-torn Berlin, uh, In the Shadow of King Saul, Essays on Silence and Song, uh, Jersey, a novel, and A Loaded Gun, Emily Dickinson for the 21st Century. like to say first of all that uh, Jay and I know each other for 65 years. Uh, we were both freshmen on the wrestling team at uh, Columbia College. I never won a match. I don't know about Jay, but I was always beaten, so I gave up wrestling as a career. Anyway, I think that uh, Jay and I are similar in some way in that uh, we both came from working class backgrounds. Uh, you would think that money would be a real concern for us, that we'd want to earn a great deal of money in terms of education. But that's not what happened at Columbia. I think Columbia really changed both of us. And when we started writing, I think we wrote in a very different way. We wanted to be bold novelists. We wanted to be adventurous novelists, not necessarily successful ones. I was wondering, Jay, if you agreed with what my feeling. I would have been very happy to be a successful novelist. <laughs> <laughs> but um, when I started out, I mean, we both, uh, I wrote two novels while I was an undergraduate, completed two, I think you did also, or maybe one? One. One novel. Takes me longer. But when I, be when I left Columbia, uh, my, my notion about what I wanted to do to support my habit of writing was that I would always find some way to earn a living not related to writing. I thought, yeah. and that way I would be free to write what I wanted to write. I wouldn't be dependent on the writing to, pay, you know, for rent. Um, fortunately, at a certain point when I pub, I did a bunch of different things. The first decade or so after Columbia, including a time as a junior executive trainee for the General Motors Corporation, believe it or not. <laughs> Uh, worked with disabled kids, muscular dystrophy kids in the summer program, different things. And then I did not, I was not set upon teaching as a career. Yeah. But when I, like you, I published when I was young, in my 20s, published a few books, um, and I began getting offers to teach. And I said, gee, okay, the hours are really, college teaching, the hours are really good. I mean, Saul Bellow uh, famously said, college teaching is a racket. <laughs> it's, um, you know, your time is your own. You can grade papers whenever you want. And uh, I lucked into a couple of very nice writing uh, positions so that I've been able always to write the books I want to write. If they succeed in the marketplace, that's even better. I can take a nice trip, go to a good restaurant. But other than that, um, I always wrote, uh, as I think you did, I wrote the books I wanted to write. 
Yeah, and I think that if you look at Jay's novels, um, he never repeats himself. I mean, they're very, very different. <laughs> My favorite is, is the Sun and Wind or Motion Picture Company, which astounds me because Jay writes about, uh, um, a, you know, the silent era, and he writes about it in a, in a very sort of postmodern, perverse, powerful, lyrical way. And what I think is a common theme or common denominator in in Jay's work, at least that I feel, is a sympathy for the underprivileged, mm -hmm. for the underclass. There's a, and I think, in part, that's being a New Yorker, or would you disagree, Jay? Um, I think growing up in New York is... is growing up, you know, lower middle class, I mean, I've written about this too, here and there, as I've done some <clears throat> books that my publishers call memoirs, although I think of them as essays in autobiography <laughs> because I write them be because I'm interested in a certain subject and I think the experience I've had can bring some light on that subject. So the book I wrote about me and my brother and his career uh, as a mental patient is really about the ways in which families do and don't cope with a member who has a lifelong mental illness. But um, we lived in a, you know, 730 square foot apartment, four of us, where there was no privacy. My father did not do well in business, to put it mildly. My mother was a nurse, worked double shifts in order for us to be able to pay modest rent. Uh, remember when the rent got raised, uh, both of us, were born before World War II. And I remember when the landlord, Mr. Fogel, remember, came by and he raised the rent from 35 to $50 a month. And my, my parents were stricken by this news. Um, so by way of saying that when you grow up sort of knowing what it's like not to be able to make ends meet and seeing what it does, I would say more to my parents than me. I mean, if I could get out of the house and get into the schoolyard and play ball, I was happy. I was happy in school, actually, when I could be with my friends. But I saw what not having money and did to my parents. And I think that enable me to, uh, as you say, to identify with those people who don't have the wherewithal other people have and how it warps their lives. And being in New York is, um, I don't know if, if it's, I mean, poverty or struggles are the same, I think, no matter where you are, Jerry. I don't know that it has a particular style in New York. Yes, but the, the city itself, the, there's something about New York City that cradles immigrants. I don't know if it's true yeah. today in 2024, but when I grew up, uh, one could, look, uh, I was the poorest kid in the world, and I was able to get the greatest education in the world by going to Columbia College. And it changed my life, as I think it changed yours. Absolutely. And I don't think any other city would have allowed me to tell, I, I mean, in the year I went to Columbia, the, the, we had state scholarships. And that year, they happened to double the number of state scholarships. And I got the very last one. <laughs> so you can see that. Yeah. Uh, and also, talking about success, I mean, to say, well, Jay, you could have won the Pulitzer Prize and your life would be very different, but it's a roulette wheel. I mean, I know that because I was on a committee for the National Book Award and the very best book doesn't win. As a matter of fact, <laughs> after I, I administrated things so that the book I wanted won, but the, the, uh, <laughs> the committee was so angry that they decided to double the number of, of people on the committee, instead of writers, they wanted librarians. So they wanted a very famous book to win. But it so happened that the writer I, I, I picked 
happened to win the National Book Award again. <laughs> so they were in a quandary. They didn't quite know what to do. So I'm saying you could have had that luck, and your life would have been very different. But I don't think you would have written a different kind of book. You, you write for yourself in some way, and you want people to love your work. But and if you don't get pleasure out of it, you're not going to do it. Or am I wrong? I hope I'm not. <laughs> Jerry, you're not you're not wrong. Um, oh my goodness! You know, we have we've known each other uh, since 1955, yeah. and we both we were in on the freshman wrestling team together. Then we were in our first writing class together with Bob Waddell, and we were massacred. They, yeah, I, I started out in freshman English with C minus. Um, you were lucky. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, the only difference, I think, sometimes, you know, dealing, as, as most writers have to, unless they've led very charmed lives, dealing with not being able to, get, having no assurance that the next book you write will be published, uh, does take a toll not ultimately, you know, I mean, my, the book of mine that was probably most successful in the marketplace, Imagining Robert, which was my 10th book, that was passed on or turned down uh, 41 times by 41 publishers over a three-year period. Um, I always, my attitude was, well, still a good book, you know, I hope it'll be published. But... Um, what it does is it sometimes takes maybe an hour more to get to, get to my desk in the morning <laughs> during those periods. But once, once I begin typing and I'm lost in words, language, and fantasies, really, because even, even work writing memoirs, which both of us, both of us have done, um, involves as much imagination as memory uh, because the imagination and memory work together and we all you know I've often talked with students about that and there's lots of studies where people think they remember such and such a place from childhood you know it was one block away and they go back and it was six blocks away so you you're also sometimes you're idealizing something that happened sometimes you're embellishing it Etc. So, but once I am in that world where I am not dealing with the actuality Thomas. of my life, yeah. I'm a happy guy. You but know, I, I lose all sense of time while I'm writing. Well, I know that when I started out, I lived in a one room closet, and I think I could have lived there for the rest of my life, and I didn't in any way feel deprived. Well, you have all that front. tuna fish, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> and, and not only that, I was robbed once, and the robber took pity on me and left me one suit because I was a substitute <laughs> teacher. But the thing is, as writers, that, that as we are, Jay and I, you have to be attuned to failure. You have to be able to accept the blow. Because if you can't accept the blow, you can't continue. Yep. And I think this is the thing that has abled, enabled us to, to, su to survive because mostly it's being turned down, mostly it's being rejected and then there's that wonderful gift and I think both of us were first published, well you were published I think first in the Transatlantic Review but then mm -hmm. in commentary as, 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 yeah, as I was. Yeah. So and it was a very very different world but now I want to talk about your new book which is uh, it's an extraordinary novel because it really recaptures the, the last 50, 70 years. And um, the character who's, to me, most appealing is an AIDS doctor. I mean, uh, and, and, and the, the thing is that uh, what he's gone through being an AIDS <coughs> doctor, and he writes, a, and, and, and I think the 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 opening chapter isn't about him but when he's introduced he writes a letter to to president 
W. Bush <coughs> calling him a murderer. And he's a professor and a, a doctor at uh, Kings County Hospital, and he's sort of told to leave or take a leave of absence, and then he goes to France. And you yourself, I was just wondering, in that town you described, I think it's called Sparacet, is that mm -hmm. right? Is that the town you lived in? Yeah. You, yeah. So, you know, it is in a way autobiographical, but uh, the, the two main characters... Well, but, uh, Jerry, although I'm, I, I'm Jewish, as you are, I didn't become a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> you did, Jay, but you just don't remember it. You just don't remember it. That's it. Your memory is failing. You. What's your name? <laughs> but the thing is, the 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 AIDS doctor, and this this again goes back to the sympathy because. Saul Davidoff, who's the, I can't say he's the hero, hero, but he's the character who appeals to me most. And um, the opening chapter takes place in Paris at the Café Fleur, which was once the, the meeting place of Sartre and Camus, and now it's the most commercial place in the world. It's a horror to be in, I know. I would never go there, you know, if anybody invited me. But the thing is, it starts out with a young woman who meets Camus. Uh, they have an, a, a one-night stand, and a few months later, he dies. And yet Camus' ghost is a kind of presence throughout the novel. I mean, Camus is there. I mean, as the, and I was wondering, uh, and there is also another ghost. And that's uh, Van Gogh, when they go to Saint Remy, and see where Van Gogh lived. And I was wondering what that, you know, what that meant to you in a way. These ghosts, how how you reacted to them? Because it is a novel about ghosts. Yeah. Because as an AIDS doctor, all Saul does is see people die, yeah. and die in horrible ways. Horrible ways, and yeah. and he's. Um, in the book, he is an AIDS doctor um, at the outset when the epidemic breaks. He's an yeah. infectious disease doctor, becomes an AIDS doctor, and for the first year or two, every patient he sees dies. Yeah. And they die horrible deaths. Uh, and actually, one of his patients follows him to yeah. France and is, um, accuses him of having killed his right. partner, his lover. And, uh, but yeah, but for me, I, when I, <coughs> let me try to answer the question by talking a little bit about how the book came about. The opening chapter, which is about uh, Tully, the woman whom Saul marries, and it opens in Paris, she has a liaison with Camus and is going to meet him in Paris when he is on the drive in which he gets killed. And I wrote that as a short story. I had no intention of writing a novel uh, set in the south of France or about an AIDS doctor. But um, after I wrote the story, two things happened. Uh, it occurred to me that I didn't want to let this woman go. I, I found myself enchanted with her as a fictional character. And so I, um, I began thinking, and here, this is, this, I didn't remember this until yesterday. I had written a novel, who maybe a dozen years before, called Natural Causes, about a doctor who goes through a, what my agent at the time called a midlife crisis. I sent it to him, and uh, my agent, Richard Parks, he called me and said, Jay, there's nothing wrong with the novel. I don't think it's your best. I also think I will have a hard time selling a book in this market about a middle-aged man going through a midlife crisis. I said, oh, 
okay. He says, go and put it on the shelf. I said, I'm at work on another novel. So uh, that's okay. And then I remembered this doctor. And so that a lot of the work that I had done on this novel came into play, as did a couple of short stories that I'd set in the south of France. Uh, but for me, I fell in love with Camus' writing when I was 17, uh, my first year at Columbia. My second year, I took a French course with uh, Donald Frame, the world-renowned Montaigne expert at the time, lovely man, who is very, became a mentor to me. And we read, I read The Stranger in French for the first time. And then I kept reading Camus. And to some degree, the, not just his work, but the fact that he was a writer and also a man who was very engagé in the world. During World War II, he risked his life in Paris as editor of Combat, the Resistance, the underground newspaper of the Resistance. He also grew up very poor in Algeria. His father died when he was two years old. His mother was illiterate, and actually, I think it's in chapter one, he's dedicating his, the book he had in the car with him when he died in a crash, is dedicated to his mother, whom he writes in a note in his journal, will never be able to read this book. She was illiterate. And so the fact that this enormous talent and a man of real courage as a writer and as a, a man, a, a political man, a politically engaged man, and also a man who loved life. I mean, he, he loved Love going women. out with friends. He loved women. Um, he, on his trip to Paris, he writes to the three different women uh, he's been having liaisons with, and he hopes to see all of them, and he was able to maintain long-time friendships with women he had relationships with, intimate relationships with. I don't remember if it's in the book. The one thing I found in one of his journals, though, is he did not, as people thought he did, <clears throat> have a liaison with Simone de Beauvoir. And in, the, in his journal, he says, I would, except after we make love, she'll probably keep talking all night long. <laughs> so that's it's encouraged in the book. him. It's in the book. <laughs> oh, it's in the book, okay. But in any event, uh, Camus, I didn't want to let him go. So just as in my own life as a writer, he was sort of there for me, emblematically maybe, as someone who could be involved in the world and be a writer. Uh, so that happened in the book, too, in the novel, yeah. And, uh, but he, he also reappears, and I think his presence is there throughout the book, and I was wondering if you could speak about that, even though I don't think most of you have read the book, but his presence remains. I mean, the, he's a specter, even though he does appear as a ghost. Mm -hmm. But it's not only Toll's well, imagination, but his, his presence is throughout the book. Yeah, he, he is there because, in terms of the construction of the book, Saul becomes an infectious disease doctor, he's inspired by reading The Plague, Camus' novel about a plague, uh, in a certain way that most medical students who go into neurology, <coughs> I think it's like if, if someone at, at the Columbia Presbyterian Hospital said, neurology residents, 57 or 60 percent of them, were inspired to become neurologists by reading Oliver Sacks. Mm -hmm. And so in the book, Saul is inspired by Camus and by his life. And Tully is haunted by him because of her relationship with him. 
And she is, <clears throat> she was a dancer, a very gifted dancer when she's young. Her mother was a dancer with the uh, Ballet de l'Opera de Paris, de, of Paris. And she wants to do a ballet about Nijinsky. And she's come to Paris partly to see something is missing from in her imagination from what to do with Nijinsky to make it into a ballet. And she takes Camus with her to the cemetery, uh, Montparnasse, you lived right near it, yeah. And, <clears throat> and it's when she visits the cemetery and sees uh, Petrushka, the, on top of Nijinsky's tomb, which had been moved from London, that she figures it out and then, as you find out at the end of chapter one, when she, she becomes a choreographer instead of a dancer, she d her dance is called Camus visit, Visits Nijinsky's Grave. You know, uh, you know, Jerry, we both, Jerry has written, well, 50 novels maybe published maybe written more on what if Flannery kind of it's an experience during which, which the hair falls out and the teeth rot it's um <laughs> but also you don't know what's going to happen and uh, I tr I when I'm doing a first draft I trust my instincts and I just sort of I I knew I could do a realistic verisimilitudinous thing of what it was like for them to have kids, what it's like when he has an affair, what they go through with their careers. And I just said that it just wasn't interesting to me. But I think there's something else, Jerry, and maybe it goes back to movies, is I do think one of the things we novelists, all of us, have learned from movies is the ability to cut. Uh, from one thing to another. Now we don't in the movies we're very accustomed to that, and I have a feeling that that influenced my not my ability or my instinct to do it, but the freedom I felt to do it. That you can simply leave it blank and leave it a mystery. I didn't I didn't know if I was even going to ever come back to it. What was important to me was that they get to this village and I didn't know what would happen. I didn't know if they could put their, their marriage back together, although they're living under the shadow of Camus because Camus, who suffered from, uh, suffered from, I don't like that, Camus had tuberculosis and he spent a year in Cabris, which is a village, uh, a village perche, one of these villages in France that are on three sides of a mountain. Uh, you know, like a triangle overlooking a valley. And it's about when I lived in Spiracet and where they go, I did put them in the village I know. Um, it's, you know, like, you know, straight up a hundred yards maybe from where Camus spent a year, which also <coughs> is meaningful. It wasn't meaningful to me at the time. I did, I think I were, I'm not sure I even knew that he had lived there when I first lived there, but it was mean. It's meaningful to them that he's sort of above them, you know, looking down on them, or his ghost is. His ghost, yeah. It's a novel of ghosts. I think we should take some questions now, Jay. Yeah. yeah. With pleasure. Yeah. Would anyone like to? Ask Jay a question. Come on, Jim. Ask. <laughs> <laughs> I, I bought the book, but I haven't read the first page yet. Well, no, I, sh I should also say it, it, it's very important because Jim Goldstein sitting there and Jay and I were in the colloquium together, which was a, uh, a class of 10 students meeting with two professors. And we always drove the second. There's a fourth person, I think, also. But we always drove the younger professor crazy because the students were so much more intelligent <laughs> than the younger professor that it was really an amazing experience. One of the 10 students is a Nobel Prize winner, another was 
a college president, another was Jay, et cetera, et cetera. So that uh, it just seems to me that the power of the word is really what you feel in this book. And I think what you're left with is, is language and the ability to, to twist the word around. And I'm, I'm looking forward to reading it. I've read some books by both of you. Yeah. And uh, it, I'm so happy because uh, I have a very uh, sort of a plebeian kind of life. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, and my wife wanted me to be a writer when I was. Yeah. I met her. In you college. should have been. You made and, a mistake. And, 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 and we actually <laughs> eloped and got married in college. Uh, but I said no. I tried. Wrote a couple of stories. This is hard work. <laughs> Writing is very hard. I gave it up and uh, instead just make some money. It's much easier. <laughs> um, but um, it's fascinating to me to read the novels that the two of you have written. And I'm extremely uh, happy that I've met you and that I had that experience and that I've been able to come here because it's, um, uh, it's good. Okay, well, uh, let me just add, while you conjure up questions, um, what Jerry's alluding to, and he and I talk about this often, in the 50s, to be at Columbia meant that whether you, were, you took the famous core curriculum whether you're going to be a doctor, lawyer, engineer, accountant, scientist. You took humanities, you took courses in, in history, you took language, you took art, music. But we lived in an environment that said there is nothing more important than ideas and books. Yeah. And that enabled uh, certainly within the college at that period of history, the premium, although many of our classmates became doctors, lawyers, etc., cetera, um, they all read, you know, Thucydides and Spinoza. I, and I have to tell you, I'm reading the Iliad now. See? <laughs> and it's much longer than I recall. <laughs> much, really? Amazing. You're, you're just more. reading a little bit slower. <laughs> 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 yeah, questions, Mike. Michael. Uh, I also went to Columbia, as you know, and uh, my senior year I took a course with Lionel Trilling, and I still remember one of the questions on the final, um, which I didn't handle very well, and that was, please discuss the sexuality in Ulysses. <laughs> and so I would say to you. Jay, say something about the sexuality <laughs> in the After Camus, which is, I think, a quite remarkable feature of the book. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to read it. Um, uh, did you hear him in the back? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The way he yeah, there's, I, I, I was sort of surprised from uh, some of the readers' reports and reviews that people like Michael commented on the sexuality. It just seemed to me natural to write about in a novel about marriage, a 40-year relationship, of two very, um, I would say, sensual people. They're people who, who are involved physically in the world. Dance and being a doctor, hands-on, all the time, the, the human body. It seemed uh, just natural to me that uh, that they would um, rejoice in, in their sexuality, be sometimes a little troubled by it, be adventurous. Uh, they are also taking a, few, a cue from Camus. Uh, I don't know what the awakened or woke people are saying about him now, but I, I see him as, as a man uh, not who was a womanizer, not a good thing, but who really enjoyed, admired, appreciated women for being different from him. Um, and I think in the book, it is a way that people come, come to know one another. I, I, I think, for me, we come to know each other as people in many different ways, but one way, especially in a book, a novel which has to do about 
deeply about friendship. Uh, so let, I'm going to jump around a little. But one of the wonderful things for me about reading Camus' journals is to read the his articulation of the importance in life of friendship mm -hmm. and how friendship is what will carry the day f for most of us <coughs> through dark times and remind us of who we are when we've had a hard time and begin to come back to ourselves. And it seems to me that in the friendship between, in, in this book anyway, uh, between men and women, um, that the ways in which people can touch each other's lives is through sexuality, is through becoming intimate, through opening themselves. And, but I didn't, what I'm saying now, I did not articulate <laughs> while I was to myself. I, it just happened when I was writing about them. Um, certainly, and uh, yeah, I don't know. Other question, Carol. Yeah. I'd like to thank you for writing a novel with three, three or four wonderful women in it. Strong women, women who are appreciated by the men in the, in the novels too. Uh, you know, the, the wife of Sam at the end of the book was kind of the new generation. <coughs> Of young women that comes mm -hmm. on the scene is a very interesting character. <laughs> and Tori is too, but she's she's kind of a bitch at times. Too, you know what I mean? She's like she's very very headstrong. <laughs> yeah, but I like her. And I, here's my question: Yeah, are any of these women from your life? <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> is that not fair? I, I, no, I mean, none of them are modeled in particular on anyone I knew, no. They may come from my knowledge of women, generally, and my women friends, but I've been very pleased in, um, in this book. When I finished it, I said, oh, I have, thank <laughs> you. I mean, I'm very, I'm very pleased that you noticed, because I felt, oh, I, I know how to create female characters who have their own individuality. Fiona, the young doctor, and um, uh, you know, I can't even remember the name of the character, his daughter-in-law. Marisa, was it Marisa? I can't remember. Marisa, yeah, who is also, he's a research scientist. And she is a, she's on wheels. I mean, she's a tough, tough woman. And, um, but uh, they're, Anyway, I, I, en I enjoy, you know, I, I, I have a, a, a friend of mine, a novelist, who called me up once and without a preamble said, Jay, I said, yeah, guess who I get to be in my next book? <laughs> I get to be a such, I mean, that, <clears throat> on the good days, that is real joy, that I simply am not myself. I don't mind being Jay, but I really enjoy being someone else on the page. And um, yeah, these I found these women fascinating. And even at the end in the uh, the scene in Harvard, I thought she's wonderful. The, uh, when she bites the guy, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> who makes a pass at her anyway. Yeah, other question. Thank you. Andre. Uh, I only saw the front page, so my my question will not be very profound as to much of this, group, but I really love the old dialogue that went through. So my question is comes might have more profoundness, asking you about the title. After Camille, does it mean that you actually let him go away from you, or did you actually liberate yourself from Camille? Oh, the title was just always there for me. Uh, yeah. It has a couple of meanings. It's what happens to them after Camus mm -hmm. when they go on with, with their lives. Oh. It also is in the sense of uh, when you write a poem in the style of another poet. 
is called After Byron, mm -hmm. After Dickinson. And to some degree, um, I had one reader already who told me he thought that the first chapter read as if it were written by Camus. Oh. And I was, I don't know that I intended that, but he was, we don't, we don't really, I don't think it's a mystical experience at all, but we don't know always where the, the gifts are coming to us. What we hope, what I, I mean, I go to, and Jerry does too, I know, many, many I use up lots of trees to make even a, a chapter, many, many revisions. But once I trust my instincts at the beginning, and sometimes they go, I go off on paths that are no good, I come back, and then I work with it to make sure it makes sense as an object, because to me a book is an object the way a sculpture is. But uh, after Camus simply means in all the different ways that you take after someone, you know, yeah. But uh, I, I just, I often don't have a title right away. This time I did. So where is Camus with you now? Hmm? Where is Camus for you now? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Molly. I had the experience of telling a younger person about this novel after Camus, and they never heard of Camus. <laughs> <laughs> I you know, as you know, I teach high school, right? And then they asked me this challenging question. Well, I said, well, he's a very famous French philosopher, and what, what were his ideas? And uh, I mean, I've you know done my small share of reading of this kind of philosophy, but I was struggling to find a good way to make it meaningful to somebody who is totally uninitiated. And I wonder if you have an answer to that. To someone who doesn't know anything about Camus, but is going to read it because their teacher told them this is a great book, you know. But and in all seriousness, how would you summarize what Camus might mean to somebody who's uninitiated? Um. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you know. You know, like maybe they could put a chip in our head of cliff notes. You know. Um, Easy answers, no, go read him, I would say. Go read him, but there is, I think near the end of the first chapter, I say something, I write something, I think it's near the end of the first chapter, I hope so, and, um, oh, I'm, I'm already at the chapter two. Oh, here it is, yeah. I have him explaining to her in a letter, but I took this from his journal. So I, I'm paraphrasing from, a, from one of his journals. And this is uh, near the end of chapter one. <clears throat> she offered, she's back in America, but she's going to come meet, she offered to meet him at the train station in Paris when he returned in January, and he accepted the offer. Her friendship had become, he wrote, of immeasurable importance to him, for as he had confided in his journal on the day her most recent letter arrived, what made the world bearable for him were feelings engendered by those elements that joined us to others. Mm -hmm. There's also the whole notion of the absurd, but friendships helped us through life, he explained, because they presupposed more of the same, a future, and because they made us sense that our only true task was to have friendships with others. And yet on those days when we became aware that this was perhaps not our only task, and above all, when we realized that it was only our will that kept others attached to us. For if we stopped writing or talking, if we cut ourselves off from others, we realized how swiftly the others melted away. People were always ready and able to be interested in something else. So that when we came to understand how contingent 
and accidental everything in what we call love or friendship was. The world went back to darkness and returned us to that great cold from which human tenderness had for a moment rescued us. And that's, I mean, that's Albert Camus and that's me using something I found. But I think that is at the heart for me of what made him, despite, in addition to his brilliance, you know, and gifts as a, as a storyteller, that made him so wonderfully human and understanding all kinds of things about how we do and don't survive, which is what the book to some degree is about, you know, because the book goes from the Vietnam, from World War II, if you take Camus, but to the Vietnam War, Iraq War, and the AIDS pandemic, and the beginning at, near the end of the book in France, the beginning of the Le Pen movement, uh, when there's a big gathering in, in the village of the right-wing Le Pen people, uh, anti-immigrant thing. So it's when all these things are there, how do we, how do we keep the qualities that he talks about or that he thinks about in that paragraph? Uh, and that, that's what drew me to him and what who, and that's why to some degree I hope some of what's in that paragraph informs the spirit of the book, maybe. And also I think the, with, with the plague has come back in fashion because of COVID. Right. So Camus is very much in the news, but you suggest something else, that there is no relationship between the generations, that something happens, it's very powerful, and then it disappears. And <coughs> It's Jay's job, in some sense, to evoke that past, to bring that past back. I personally hated the plague, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't really matter because it's very, very important uh, to the novel. And I think that what makes the novel so extraordinary is that like an accordion, it sort of collapses and, and, and expands and takes us from one generation to the next in a very, very powerful way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Any, maybe take uh, one more question? Yeah, uh, Anders. Jay, uh, uh, wonderful. But uh, what about his friendship with Jean Paul? Uh, Camille's famously came into conflict with Jean Paul Sartre. Right. Does that enter into the proceedings? Uh, th I think there's a note or two in the book about it. Yes, the, I, 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 having read the book, and Jay doesn't remember anymore. <laughs> there, was a, there was a big fight between Camus and Sartre, and Camus believed that Algeria should remain as a French department, yeah. that it should remain within the empire or whatever of France, and Sartre very much wanted Camus, wanted Algeria to be independent. Yeah. And both of them broke on that question. Yeah. And though we could answer, you know, who was right or who was wrong, I think that was the end of their friendship, Jay. That was, yes, yeah, 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 that was it, yeah. Yeah, Ca Camus was very much book. for... It, I should remind you it's in the book. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. I, you know... I remember once when, when we were, Jerry and I taught together uh, at Stanford. Jerry was there first. He recommended me. I had published my first novel. They invited me. I was at a party at Stanford once um, with some faculty, and somebody was telling a story, and everyone was laughing. I said, oh, what a great story. And someone looked at me. That's fr I was just telling... <laughs> something from one of your novels. I said, oh. <laughs> so it, it, it's, so th this is not a senior moment. It's, it's really, I, I, I never read, uh, once a, my book is published, unless I give a reading from a novel, I would never read it again. It's dead. It's yeah. dead once it's I want on to the next, you know. So, um, 
Yes, Karen. I, I, I have a, a question. Maybe it's for both of you. Um, what the, uh, it's impressive, the, the, the decades over which you've published and your experience as writers, you also have seen how the literary and publishing and reading worlds have changed over time. So when you sit down to write now, um, does that, the world we're in now, play a part in how you approach your, your, your writing? Um, or are you able to just retreat and into the world you have created for yourself without <coughs> thinking of the readership that you now have when you write? You that, that's answer? a very powerful question, Jay. Do you want to answer first or do you want me to answer you go. first? You go. I think whether you like it or not, it, it, it does in some way um, <coughs> inhibit you mm -hmm. in terms of what is uh, in fashion and what is out of fashion. For I'll give you I'll give you two examples. There was a recent film about uh, Leonard Bernstein. Uh, I don't know if you saw yes, it. Yes. It wasn't about Leonard Bernstein. It was about Leonard Bernstein's wife, mm -hmm. and that was the film. Whether you like it or not, it was basically about his wife. And Lenore is now reading a, a, a book about the wives of five famous writers. And it seems to me that what has happened is that um, the wives that w who, who were very, very important uh, to the writers themselves have suddenly replaced the writers and have taken over. And we live in a very different world. And <coughs> whether you like it or not, I think it does affect you. I don't know how LJ would answer that, but. Oh my goodness. Um, <coughs> yeah, the sociology of the marketplace that we're living in now. I, I think, you know, the novel has had its day. I mean, it may have its day again. I mean, we could discuss it forever. I mean, the advent of movies, the advent of the computer, uh, television, et cetera, et cetera. There are many other places people go to for news, which is novel comes from nouvelle, uh, or to find it, to find out how people live in other places. And I think because of the various, because of computers, smartphones, uh, I think the attention span required for something this thick, and this is not all that thick, it just isn't there in, in most young people anymore. I mean, when I, if I didn't, if I came home and I didn't immediately go out to play ball with my friends or go to some part-time job I had, I would lie down on my bed and read a novel for the afternoon. I would assume that if X percent of pe people my age did that, then, uh, X minus Y percent now go on their smartphones or on their computers. They're just not in the habit of reading the way we were. Um, that being said, and there's, the rest is for sociologists and historians, the fact that the novel is certainly, the kinds of novels we write, is nowhere near central to uh, the, the literature anymore. It's just not. Um, it is, to me, is neither here nor there. I mean, as I often say, you know, I'm too old to become an orthodontist. I, I just don't know what else. I don't know how to do anything else uh, at this age uh, other than to write stories. Take, uh, maybe take one more. Yeah, yes. I think there was a question. Well, yeah, I've been, it occurred to me, I'm a painter, and the current narrative in painting, realism and narrative in painting, is so very current. And it's been a revolutionary turn in that way, because it was the end of that kind of painting for many years. Do you think there's a parallel? Yeah. M might be, might be. I, these things, you know, remember the novel as we know it really doesn't come into being in English until uh, Robinson Crusoe 
fielding, you know, end of the 18th century. I mean, it's just a fairly new form. Movies, the cinema is even more new. <laughs> you know, so what does not die, and maybe this will be a nice note to end on, uh, storytelling doesn't die, whether the storytelling is in a novel, a short story, a poem, a movie, a television show, a painting, uh, a symphony, which has its own, you know, line that we follow and that has its own narrative. Faulkner said if he could write music, he would never have written a word on paper. <laughs> so, but uh, anyway, thank you for coming.